next few videos are going to be about an incredible area of physics my one of my favorite areas of physics um called Fourier analysis and it's not just an important area in physics it's it's an absolutely essential across practically all of science and so much of engineering because Fourier and because Fourier analysis allows us to take complicated signals, complicated functions, complicated waveforms, and break them down into the component parts. And what are the component parts? Well, when it comes to Fourier analysis, we consider functions and waveforms in terms of sinusoidal contributions. We build up a function or a waveform signal from sines and cosines. That's it. Just we're going to see some subtle, some elegant mathematics over the course of the next few videos. Just always bear in mind that this is all, all we're doing in one sense. Building up a function from sines and cosines. By adding those sines and cosines in just the right way in terms of the amplitudes we use, the frequencies we use, the phases we use. And if we add them up in the right way, what's incredible is not only can we synthesize periodic functions, we can also build up aperiodic functions, which seems bizarre. We can use sines and cosines, which are periodic functions, to create aperiodic functions and to characterize and to analyze aperiodic functions too. We'll get back to that. The first point to realize is that you've come across Fourier analysis. I'm pretty certain that you've used Fourier processing and Fourier analysis at some times in your life over the last um, n years. So my phone, on my phone I've got lots of music and if I go to music settings, then what I find is here the EQ, equalization. And I've got a whole range of presets. And I can also go in and custom tune the various different frequency bands. I can say I want a little bit more bass, or I want to pull down the mid range, or I want to bring up the top end. In terms of the frequencies, what I'm doing there is Fourier processing. I'm changing the mix of frequencies in the signal. And that's, that's the essence of Fourier analysis. You've done this before. Similarly, if you've ever downloaded a JPEG or you've encountered a JPEG online, the way that image is represented or the compression algorithm that JPEGs use is based entirely on considering that image as a mixture of different waves, spatially, obviously, in this case, not temporally, but spatially, as a mixture of different waves on the screen. And we'll come back to that as well. There's a great demo online by the same company that um, provides the software that I use for aspects of the interactive figures embedded in the blog post. As you can see, as I'm talking, the top screen, the top graph there, F of T, is um, obviously mapping out how my voice is changing over the course of time. And you can see that the x-axis goes up to 0 0.01 seconds, which is 10 milliseconds. It's the lower graph, however, that we're really interested in, and it's going to be the graphs of that type that are going to be the focus of the next few videos. That's a frequency spectrum. It shows the frequencies that are making up that signal in the top graph. The frequencies that we need to include and bring together and the magnitudes of those frequencies, the relative magnitudes, to, to build up and create that signal. What Fourier analysis does is that it... it changes or translates, mathematically translates from time to frequency. And these are what are called conjugate variables. And it's important to note this. Time and frequency are reciprocally related. What's the unit that we use for frequency? Hertz. What's the unit of time? Second. What is a hertz? It's a second to the minus one. It's one over seconds. So we've got this reciprocal relationship between the period of a wave, t, and its frequency, 1 over t. Similarly, and this is key, we can think of a pattern in space, and we can define, like a zebra crossing is a great idea, and we'll come back to the zebra crossing soon. That has got a particular spatial frequency. It's got a number of wavelengths per unit length. Okay, let's start looking at the mathematics of Fourier analysis. First of all, we're going to look at two approaches. First is the Fourier series approach. And then later on in the next video, we're going to look at the Fourier transform approach. What's the difference? The Fourier series approach we use for periodic functions. So functions that repeat in time or repeat in space. Fourier transforms, quite remarkably, we can use those to look at aperiodic functions. What do I mean by aperiodic functions? There's an aperiodic function. A blip, a spike is an aperiodic function. 
Okay, so the fundamental premise with Fourier series approach is that we can represent a function as a discrete sum, and I'll explain what I mean by discrete sum soon, of sine waves with different amplitudes, different frequencies, and different phases. There are some functions for which this won't work. There are some functions that are not amenable to Fourier analysis. I'm not, this is not a Fourier analysis course. I'd love to do, if I did Fourier analysis course many years ago, I'd love to do it again. But this is not a Fourier analysis course. But what I want to get across are the key concepts underpinning Fourier analysis, and in particular, how important Fourier analysis and thinking in terms of time versus frequency, position versus momentum, and how Fourier transforms and Fourier analysis connects time and frequency and position and momentum. So with this, that's my rationale and motivation in terms of Fourier analysis. Quantum mechanics is ultimately about interactions, we're, treat, we're, we're imbuing matter with wave-like characteristics. Fourier analysis is all about how we combine waves, how we superpose waves, etc. So there's a, there's a direct, complete integration and link between Fourier analysis and quantum mechanics. So I'm not going to go into the, the absolute rigorous nitty gritty mathematical detail and say, well, these are the functions that if they don't um, satisfy these criteria, then we can't do Fourier analysis. The functions we're going to look at and the vast majority of functions that physicists are interested in are amenable to Fourier analysis. Okay, with that health warning out of the way, let's write down, where's my chalk? Um, take a brand new stick of chalk. Right, so let me write down the Fourier series representation of a function. We're going to consider our function f of t, so it's a function of time, fairly arbitrary function. We're going to consider time first, but remember this, what I'm talking about in terms of time also is true of um, functions that vary spatially as well. So this could just as equally well be x, but for now we'll, we'll focus on time. Fun f of t can be represented as follows, I'll write this down and then I'll explain it. N's an integer. Let me move this around, make sure you're going to get everything. Yeah. N's an integer. It runs between n is equal to minus infinity and plus infinity. Now, not all Fourier series need uh, an infinity of terms, otherwise, this would be a very long video. Um, I'm going to show you an example soon where we've got far fewer terms than that. But mathematically, we need to consider. To, this is an approximation to a function. We need to consider an infinite number of terms in principle. We'll also see later on how when we come to Fourier transforms, we're also going to be, we're going to be doing an integration over that range between plus and minus infinity. Right. So then we have, well, let me write this down first and then I'll explain it. So what we are saying is that a function, f of t, can be written down as the sum of a set, okay, have I fallen off the screen? Can be written down as the sum of a set of functions, e to the i n omega zero t, and we have co coefficients c subscript n, where n is an integer, so this goes c one, c two, c three. It also goes c minus one, c minus two, c minus three, and those coefficients tell us how much of each one of these functions we need to add into our mix to get a good approximation to f of t, to synthesize. And that's actually where the, the term synthesizer came from. It really came from Fourier synthesis, where you add up different waves to get different sounds. That's really where the term synthesizer came from. So what we want to do is synthesize this function from these component functions. Or, to use a mathematical term, and we're going to see this a lot later on, a basis set of functions. This is our basis set, e to the i n omega 0 t. And these coefficients tell us, as I said, how much of each one of these functions we need. This is an integer. n is an integer. So we, this runs from integer steps. Look here, though. Let me get some. Do I have, yeah. I'll use some green, I'll use some green chalk for emphasis. We've got e to the i n omega zero t. So you remember from last week, 
So complex exponential, therefore it's via Euler, it's uh, trigonometric functions, it's, we've got cos n omega zero t plus i sine n omega zero t. What's n omega zero? Well, what's omega zero? Well, omega, as you know, is traditionally an angular frequency. The reason I put an omega zero on there is to highlight that this is a, a fundamental frequency. What do I mean by that? Well, you remember, hopefully, from, maybe if I do it down here, from last year, and also in terms of um, A-level, you remember waves on a string. There's a fundamental. There's a second harmonic. I call the fundamentals differs from engineering and physics, and it differs between different physicists. That's an awful, hang on. Let's at least get something that's vaguely symmetrical. That'll do. First harmonic, second harmonic, third harmonic. So when we pluck the string, it oscillates some of this, oscillates some of this, some of that, etc., and we get a note in the end, which is due to a summation of those different um, frequencies. That's why a note on piano sounds no from a, different from a note on guitar. It can be a B note or a C note or whatever, or an A note or whatever. The fundamental frequency might be the same, but the overall pattern in time is different because the contributions of the different harmonics is different. That's what we're doing here. We are summing up different harmonics. So the omega zero is our fundamental. Our first harmonic, we'll call that our first harmonic. N equal to two gives us our second harmonic, third harmonic, etc. That's what Fourier analysis is all about. And what we have is a superposition of those different waves, which gives us our final function in the end. So what we're going to do now is treat possibly, no, it's pretty much the simplest possible Fourier series we could think about. Okay, let's think of a pure sinusoidal tone. Now, I could choose a sine. There's a good reason why I'm not choosing a sine initially. I'm going to choose a cosine instead for reasons which hopefully will become clear soon. So let's say that the, this is our function. Hang on, let me align it with this. Let's say our function is f of t is equal to cos omega zero t. The question is, what is our Fourier representation of this? Now, you can look at that and you can say, well, okay, that's just one term. So I know that I'm just going to have a single frequency. You're absolutely right. Your Fourier series is effectively just that term. But notice we've expressed this in the complex representation. You need to get used to, to dealing with, with complex numbers. We're going to see in a lot of complex numbers. So let's write this in terms of its complex representation. So remember what that is. That's a half e to the i omega zero t plus a half e to the minus i omega zero t. If you don't see where that comes from, pause the video now and make sure you see where that comes from. And if you still don't see where it comes from, look in the notes last week. And if you still don't see where it comes from, get in touch with me as a matter of some urgency, okay? because we're going to be doing a lot of this. So, cos omega zero t is a half e to the i omega zero t plus a half e to the minus i omega zero t. Let me get this trigonometric representation out of the way, just to make it clearer. And let's compare this to this. So here it runs from n is equal to minus infinity to plus infinity. Well, clearly we don't have an infinite number of terms. What we have are two terms. One term, which has got n is equal to one, which we can tell from this, n here, if we set n equal to one, we get e to the i omega zero t, just our fundamental, and we've got n is equal to minus one over here. Make sense? Yeah, good. He says to the camera. Um, so, what we have is our Fourier series representation. We have it in this form already. Except instead of an infinite number of terms, we just in for cosine, we just need two terms. And we've just got one, one cosine wave at one frequency at the fundamental omega zero. So our Fourier series in this case, the CNs are pretty straightforward. We've got C1 is equal to a half. And tell me what C minus one is. Pause the video. Have a think. I think you'd be able to see that C uh, minus one is 
is equal to a half two. There we go. So C one's a half, C minus one's a half. Right, what we're gonna do now is draw our Fourier spectrum. You saw the Fourier spectrum on the computer. We're gonna have to think a lot about Fourier spectra over the course of the quantum uh, world. And also you're gonna see a lot in wave phenomena. So let's, let's do our, our Fourier spectrum. It's pretty straightforward. Remember that our C1 is equal to C minus one is equal to a half. And our, let's write our Fourier series in full. So our Fourier series was Ft is equal to a half, e to the i omega zero t, plus e to the i minus, sorry, e to the minus i omega zero t. So now we've got something which is conceptually in principle, if you try, you know, get too hung up on this, can drive you around the twist, but it's, um, here we've got positive frequency, here we've got negative frequency. Don't get too hung up on, on, on the, 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 the idea of on the, the, the physics as it's such of negative frequency. It's just a way of representing the wave. That's it. It's just a way of representing the wave. It turns out that it's very powerful because what we want to think about is the symmetry of different functions. We're going to be doing Fourier integrals soon. And so once we're integrating, we sell... We save ourselves a lot of work if we can look at the symmetry of the function. But more than that, it's also because thinking about symmetry is absolutely core to so much of physics and certainly for quantum mechanics. So by thinking about, by representing this in terms of positive and negative frequencies and thinking about the symmetries, it's, it's given us a deeper insight in some ways into the physics. So, but just don't get hung up and saying, well, what's a negative frequency? I don't know. Just, it's a way of representing the wave. So, f of t is equal to half e to the i omega t plus e to the minus i omega t. Let's finally draw our spectrum. So, our spectrum is going to be, notice first of all, that our terms, these are complex valued coefficients, but our terms are both real. So, we've got no imaginary terms. One of the workshop questions is to ask you to apply a similar type of analysis to sine omega zero t, and then you're going to see that imaginary terms do start to play a big role. But in this case, this is the reason I chose cos omega zero t is that our terms are real, our coefficients are real. So let's write this. I'm, I'm going to write this. I could put just I could put um, harmonic number or coefficient number or, or n on this axis. I want to put this. I'm going to put this in terms of frequency. So I really want to get hammer home that what we're doing here is translating from fre from time to frequency. So this axis is frequency, angular frequency. It could be f, but we'll, we'll, make it, we'll make it omega. And here, this is a real part of our coefficients. They are purely real, so it's just, in this case, very straightforward. So we have, this is a half. So our spectrum is we've got one peak, which is up to a half at omega zero, and then equally spaced, if I can do that so it's vaguely symmetric. And over here we've got minus omega zero. That's our spectrum. That's our spectrum for a cosine wave. Now, let's say we had a term, um, so we had cosine, one term at cosine omega zero t, but let's say we had the second harmonic in the mix, cosine two omega zero t. And let's say we had twice as much of the second harmonic as the first harmonic. Then what we'd have over here would be, let's extend this axis a little bit. Extend it this a little bit. Equidistant, say roughly here, two omega zero. We'd have another term, except it'd look like that because we've got twice as much of the second harmonic as the first harmonic. And this would go up to one. And if we had n harmonics with different heights, etc., that's that's all we do. We have separate spikes telling us these are the frequencies we have, and the height of those spikes tells us how much of that component we want. Now, notice we're only looking at the real part here because there is only the real part. In general, these are complex values, so they're real and imaginary. So all the things I said last week about complex numbers and modulus and phase apply here. Often with Fourier analysis, what we just do is we chuck away that phase information 
which is sometimes a dangerous thing to do. But that's what we do. That's what physicists tend to do often. They, they look at the modulus squared of those Fourier coefficients, or as we'll see, the Fourier transform. That gets rid of the phase information and just basically tells us about the magnitudes of the um, frequency components. So in this particular case, we plotted the real part. We could plot the real and the imaginary parts, and we can plot the modulus or the modulus squared of the um, complex numbers. So I've set up a little um, simulation. Simulation is too grand a word. Interactive figure is a better word. Um, in this week's uh, blog post, which allows you to change the amplitude, to change the frequency, and to change the phase, and to see the effect it has. And it's only for a single Fourier component. But just to focus on that single Fourier component, that single sine or cosine, or phase shifted sine, and look at um, the, the effect on the Fourier spectrum. So, okay, so here's what it looks like. Right at the top, we've got our standard representation in time. Here, in red, we're plotting the real um, parts of the coefficients. And the blue, which you can't see because there is no blue, because there's no imaginary at this point, um, those would be, we'll see blue appear in a little while, um, those are the imaginary parts of the coefficients. And here is the modulus squared. Remember, they're complex values. So in this case, they're purely real. So the modulus squared is a half squared, which gives us a quarter, 0.25. And so you see here... Those um, two coefficients, C1 and C-1, are a half, just as we had on the blackboard. And we get the modulus squared, and that becomes a quarter. Now, play with this to your heart's content until you understand what's going on. So frequency, hopefully, is relatively straightforward. If I push up the frequency, remember that we've got a positive frequency and a negative frequency. As I change the frequency, they move away, symmetrically away from the, the y-axis. If I change the amplitude, hopefully you know what's going to happen. You could pause the video <laughs> at this point but, and have a guess at what's going to happen. But I, you, I think it's fairly straightforward that if I change the amplitude, what happens is I reduce the amount of the wave I need. Therefore, I reduce the height of these spikes. So I reduce the height of the peaks in the Fourier spectrum. Phase is a little bit more interesting. So at the moment, the phase, so this is in units of plus or minus pi. At the moment, the phase is um, pi over 2, which gives us the cosine wave. Let me push this down so you can see phase in action a little bit better. It's 8 hertz, 7 hertz. We'll go for 7 hertz. Um, now, if I change the phase, know what happens. Well, first of all, you can see what's happening to the, the wave in time. It's shifting, as you'd expect, as I change the phase. But notice what's happening to the real and imaginary parts in the Fourier spectrum. Think about why that is in terms of the basis of what we discussed last week. But also note, and this is not because the, the code has stopped working or anything like that. Notice that as I change the phase, as we'd expect from last week, absolutely nothing happens to the modulus squared. Or indeed nothing happens to the modulus because the modulus is completely insensitive to changes in phase. As is the modulus squared. But the real and imaginary parts are changing. Hopefully that will help. Playing around with that will help. That's a fairly simple function that we can do the, the furry analysis in our heads. Um, by inspection, as they say. However, if we have a function 